welcome to Barb's Book Spot. I have three books I'd like to share with you today, and I chose these because I think they're seasonally appropriate, but also because I think they'd make great mentor texts. Um, they not only tell a story, they might be fun to read aloud, but they also illustrate something that I think might be important for you or your students, um, so I'd just like to share them with you now. The first book is called The Great Thanksgiving Escape, and it's by Mark Fearing. It's published by Candlewick, and it was published just this year in 2014. This book tells the story of how children feel at our big holiday events. So they've come to their Thanksgiving at Grandma's and they're feeling pretty claustrophobic and pretty unimportant. I think the first picture illustrates very well how they feel. So we start with this big far off look at everybody arriving at Grandma's and then the next page shows us Gavin and how he's feeling. You'll notice we can't even see the heads of the grown-ups. All he's seeing are smelly feet and smelly coats and lots of stuff. Very claustrophobic feeling. A lot of the pictures will show Gavin and another little girl, Rhonda, who you'll meet later, very small when they're with the grown-ups. And then in other pages where they're feeling a little more power, a little more freedom, they'll be a little larger in the picture. So watch how the size of the characters changes because this book's a lot about point of view. It was another Thanksgiving at Grandma's. You can play in here with the rest of the kids, Gavin's mother told him. We'll call you when the turkey's ready. So you can see they're not very happy. Everybody looks the wrong age. There's somebody looks like they're babysitting. Not a very fun time. Well, Gavin's tolerating things until he sees Rhonda crawl out from underneath the coats and say, let's get out of here. In fact, she says, what do you say we break out of here and head for the swing in the backyard? So that's the challenge. They're going to escape and find their power. Notice the white space. They're still pretty small. They're still in with all the other children. And when you get to the next page, look at the size. They're, they're concocting their plan. All right. That, that juxtaposition of small and large size works throughout the whole text. I'm going to show you a couple of my favorite pages. They have to negotiate the Hall of Ants. Again, they're very small. And they have to... Oh no, the Great Wall of Butts! <laughs> How are they going to get around? They don't want to become between them and the TV. <laughs> so I think it's a fun book. It's a fun read aloud. In the end, we're almost there. See how big they are. They're ready to get outside. They've escaped the relatives. And then on the very last page, a little bit of a surprise ending. Of course, it's a typical Thanksgiving, and it's horrible weather, but I think they go outside anyway to have a good day. So Gavin and Rhonda, I think, will be a lot of fun, and it might be a fun read aloud for your Thanksgiving crowd. The next book I've chosen to share with you is also Candlewick 2014 publication, and it's called And Then Comes Christmas. It's by Tom Brenner, and it's illustrated by Deanna Christie. I chose this book because I just love the language. I was recently asked to find a book that had beautiful language, some books that were used in a reading class here, and this was one that I pointed out to those instructors. I'm just going to read you a couple of pages so you can get a feel for what I'm talking about. When the days barely start, and then they're over again, and red berries blaze against green shrubs, and bare branches rake across the sky, then hang boughs of fir or spruce or pine dotted with cones and bits of holly welcoming winter. When frost glistens on pastures and fence posts and icy grass crunches underfoot and dark clouds sit low on the horizon, then fill the windows with paper snowflakes and frame the house with colored lights. You'll see that most of the pages are this full bleed double page spread Lots of lovely colors. The pictures represent exactly what's going on in the text. And the verbs are strong. The language is very descriptive. So we have things raking across the sky, blazing. And I just love the language, the poetic style. And yet there's not too much. I think a very young crowd could enjoy this book. I'll just give you a couple of examples of other pages. I love the full expanse of it and the deep colors. When you get to this page here, when winter break is just hours away and programs and concerts are over and mama's and papa's gifts are done, we're at school and we see 
somebody making a little tree, tree, uh, Christmas tree ornament, and we see somebody making a little Hanukkah star, a star of David. So I think there's a little bit of multicultural representation, a little bit of interreligiousness, um, but it's a very secular story overall. I think it's the celebration of secular Christmas, but it's the event, it's the season, it's the decoration, and all of that that the emphasis is on, not on the religion. So I think it might fit nicely in with a set of books that you might read for the holidays. I like that on the page where they're getting ready to come down for Christmas morning, the pacing changes. We start to see more white space. Let me find my page here. As they're getting ready to come down the stairs, here we go. And we see the spacing, we see white space around. It kind of slows you down a little bit. We get an idea of the sequence of events happening as the children are ready to go down for their Christmas morning. And then at the very Christmas morning, at the very end, they celebrate the magic of Christmas as a family. So it's very lovely. I'd like to show you my favorite page, just because I think it's beautiful, and for no other reason. When one by one the lights go out and the whispering and shushing dwindles off, the whole world seems to be waiting. And I could just pause at this page forever. <laughs> I like the if or when, then sequence. You could talk about a little predicting or a little bit of anticipation. When this happens, what do we do next? What do you do at your house? I can see a lot of room for interaction around this book. And my last selection today was published by Henry Holt in 2013. It's called Hanukkah in Alaska. It's by Barbara Brown, and illustrations are by Stacy Schuett. This was published in 2013, so I think it came out right towards the end of last year, probably at Christmas time. Um, this is more about moose in Alaska than it is about Hanukkah, actually. It's set in Alaska. We start out with a giant moose, and I'm just going to read you a couple of pages here, too, so you can get a feel. In Alaska, in winter, we have to watch out for moose. We have to look both ways when we go out the door, making sure there are no moose around. That's because moose are very big, and they kick things that surprise them or make them angry. Their big kicks are strong enough to dent a car. My mother drives slowly in the winter, looking out for moose. When my friends and I are playing outside and a moose comes along, we have to hug a tree. A moose can't step on you or knock you over if you're hugging a tree. One more page. Also during winter in Alaska, it's dark. Not just at night for sleeping, but almost all the time. It doesn't get light until it's ready to snack time at school, and it's dark again practically right after lunch. Daytime is only five hours long, and sometimes when there's so much snow that it covers up the windows, daylight can barely peek in. Alaska snow piles up everywhere. It gets so deep that the moose with their skinny legs have trouble walking in it. They like to use people's shovel driveways and paths. Lots of detail, lots of description, but not very much uh, figurative language, very different than the book we just looked at about Christmas. There's not the flowery, uh, metaphor kind of language. This is details, very good details that help us visualize. And I think it would be a good model for writing for children. You don't have to have a lot of similes and metaphors if you don't want them. You can give good, strong details, and that will give you a good picture in your reader's mind of what you're talking about. The issue in this book is that the little girl's afraid that this moose who is camped out in their yard is going to damage her swing. It's eating the tree that her swing hangs from, and she's very nervous about this moose ruining everything. And so she's keeping an eye on the moose, and she can hardly concentrate on Hanukkah celebrations. She heard about a moose that tore somebody's swing up, and she's thinking about that, and she's worried about her swing. And so as we go through the book, even though they're having fun and playing and doing things, always in the back of our mind is that moose, and what are they going to do about the moose? So there's a problem solution going on here as well. Again, we see nice use of white space for pacing. We see her getting ready to go outside. Dad said, come on, we have to go outside and see something special, and she doesn't know what that is yet. I should tell you they've tried everything to coax this moose out of the yard. They tried spinach, they tried apples, they tried corn, they put things out, food, all kinds of things in the yard, and the moose doesn't want any of it. He wants to eat the tree with the swing on it. So they've pretty much given up on coaxing him away. So here's the moose by the swing, and here's the family all looking up at the stars. And what they're waiting for is spectacular. It's the Aurora Borealis. 
and so Dad's showing, look, look at the aurora. And this is where the figurative language starts. Suddenly, Dad points up to the sky. There are pink and purple and orange ribbons of light. The sky is full of color, all swirling and shining and glowing against the dark black of the sky. The lights are bright and beautiful. I have never seen anything like this. So much light and so big, filling the sky, coloring the sky. A rainbow on black velvet. Later on, she describes it like melted crayons across the sky. So here we start to get a little more, a different kind of description, a nice mentor text as well for that, for, for teaching young writers. How do you describe something so that someone can visualize it? So I'm going to go flip to the back. There's a little bit of a surprise ending because she's still worried about the swing because the moose is over there getting closer and closer. And she finds something in the house that she thinks will coax the moose away, and it seems to be working. And so she's backing up, laying something in the snow, and the new moose is following her away from the swing. And finally, her parents say, what did you do? What did you use to coax the moose? And she says, latkes. She brought latkes out that her mother had prepared for their Hanukkah celebration, and evidently the moose likes latkes. Hanukkah, Hanukkah can be pretty funny in Alaska, and miracles can happen in a lot of different ways. So again, a very engaging story, a simple story. I think a lot of children would be able to read this on their own, but I think as a teaching tool, you could not only just enjoy the story, but use it as a mentor text for how to write and how to give detail in a story. Well, thanks very much for listening. I hope to see you again soon. Happy holidays.